Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about a rotational day within a rotational week within a rotational year. Friday finishing on this week on the uh, on the 17th with a choppy period. Everything finishing the day in the uh, in the red with financials and energy leading the way down. We'll look at the big picture using the Mindful Investor Live chart list and focus on how the conditions have changed with a renewed strength from defensive like real estate and also uh, uh, weakening breadth conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the power of stock charts, using the technical analysis toolkit to better understand price, breadth, sentiment, trend, momentum, all of those characteristics that help us quantify investor behavior and make sense of, uh, of the markets in uncertain times. This is our last live show of uh, 2021. We've got some great content coming at you for the next uh, couple of weeks, but excited to wrap this week and in some ways wrap 2021 uh, and, uh, and, and try to make sense of this overall market. I was interviewed earlier today uh, for the Wall Street Journal, and we were talking about the market conditions. And what I tried to describe to them is the, the, the phrases, the adjectives I would use are rotational, uncertain uh, and those are not sort of raging bull market kind of terms. Those are terms you use when it's a market in flux, when there's no real clear leadership, when there are a lot of question marks going into uh, going into year end. And what's interesting about that is all of that is happening. We have competing narratives of the Fed and the coronavirus and infrastructure spending and stimulus spending and all of that. But it's within the context of the seasonally strongest part of the year. This is the part of the year that tends to be relatively strong. You tend to have strength right at the, uh, you know, waiting on the doormat of the uh, Santa Claus rally here in the next couple of weeks. Should be fairly strong, but you're not getting that sort of feeling from the market today. We have great guests on the show. I was super excited with some of our guests recently. And if you missed them, go to Stock Charts TV on demand because there's some really good conversations. Sam Stovall in particular yesterday was a lot of, uh, a lot of great market wisdom talking about uh, market returns around Fed tightening cycles and, uh, and so forth. Coming up, uh, just so you, uh, so you know, we had our latest episode of The Pitch just yesterday. And if you missed that, missed that go to stockcharts.com slash The Pitch. It's a really good discussion with three great experts. The next two weeks on Stock Charts TV will look a little different than our normal programming because it's all of our year-end content. Most importantly, our top 10 influential market events starts on Monday, every weekday, uh, next week and the week after at 11 a.m. Eastern, we will air a new influential market event. We have 10 different guest experts, each describing that particular market event, what it meant to them, how to analyze and understand it from a technical perspective. Two weeks that will help you make sense of this uh, of this market environment. On this show, we'll take be taking a holiday break. No live shows here, but we have some really good content we put together for you. Next week, we're going to be airing uh, my top five charts of 2021. I put together a discussion focused on the five charts. I think that uh, tell a tell a pretty decent narrative about the market and what this uh, what this year has meant. How to think about 2022 and some of the themes to look for at the beginning of next year. The week after, the week of uh, December 27th, we'll be airing uh, five parts where we look at uh, how to review your performance in 2021. How to review and uh, reflect on what this year has meant for you as a trader, as an investor, and how to set yourself up with good routines for the year to come. So really good content, hopefully for the next two weeks on the final bar. Also elsewhere on Stock Charts TV with our top 10 influential market events. Also as a reminder, go to stockcharts.com slash special. We have our holiday special running all through the end of, uh, of this year. You can get basically two months off of your Stock Charts uh, premium membership if you renew it by the end of this year, if you've never been a premium member and taken advantage of some of the great functionality like the scanning engine, all the chart lists, all the customization of your charts, it's a really good time to do so because it's the best time of the year to join, to be honest with you. Go to stockcharts.com slash special for all the information and to uh, upgrade or renew your current uh, membership. 
Let us wrap the week. Two main parts to our show on Friday. First, we wrap the week. We'll look at some of the uh, the weekly returns and what they mean, and then we'll answer some of your questions from the mailbag. We'll start off with a poll, though. I asked you recently, is the next 25% move in Bitcoin higher or lower? Dead even in terms of the results, 53 to 47, saying 25% higher or 25% lower. Now, if we asked this question a couple months ago, it would have been very interesting to look at the results there. I'll have to look back in the uh, at the data to see the last time we asked and what the result was there. But certainly a, a, mixed, uh, a mixed reaction to where we're at right now, which is... To be honest with you, that's probably justifiable given the uh, given given the price action. Uh, Bitcoin and Ether, uh, most of cryptocurrencies, uh, lower today. The RSI, the momentum on uh, on Bitcoin in particular, relatively low. Not oversold, but overall, uh, you know, well below fifty and remaining there. You've gone from a pattern of accumulation to a pattern of distribution since that big bearish divergence October and November, when we finally broke above uh, sixty five thousand. It's been repelled, and from there, it's been a slow and steady decline with some significant jumps down along the way, but overall, it's just been chipping away. Today, we are closing. If we close where we're at, we will be closing below the 200-day moving average for the first time since September. So quite a reversal from the strength in October to the weakness in the last month. And, And again, on a chart like this, I don't see a great reason to look for upside potential until you see signs of accumulation. At this point, it's a chart in distribution mode. Let's look briefly at what the markets did today, and then we'll look uh, we'll look at the weekly returns here. So the S and P down. It was a choppy day uh, at, to wrap up a choppy week. This is a, basically a, a a day that I think um, illustrates the concept of uncertainty in chart format. Right. Yesterday was a sell off. Wednesday we had the Fed meeting with the rally into the close. Yesterday was more of a distribution. I would argue recognizing the implications of what the Fed comments actually will mean for investors going into next year. And today, sort of a choppy, uncertain type of uh, type of market, but selling off into the close, which is noteworthy. Um, the Nasdaq actually finished about flat for the day. The Dow was down about one and a half percent. Small caps actually higher. So it was sort of a choppy, a little of everything type of market. And the VIX is back above twenty, just below twenty two. Interest rates coming down again today with the 10-year yield right around 140. The tech they're coming down uh, yesterday as well. The dollar index back higher and continuing that long-term uptrend we've talked about. Gold had spiked higher in the morning, but spent most of the day um, giving back those gains and then finished in the red, down 0.2%. Silver down half a percent as well. Energy prices down fairly significantly. That's why the energy sector was one of the worst places to be so far. And then in crypto land, a lot of red uh, on the uh, on the page with Bitcoin, Ethereum both down uh, over two percent uh, in the last eight. Others down actually significantly uh, more. And so you look, this has been a downtrend in cryptocurrencies for uh, for quite some time. I you know I two things that seem fairly uh, fairly certain to me. Although that's a horrible thing to say as an investor, but things I see as pretty likely: the long term potential of the blockchain technology, absolutely. The long-term uptrend or the long-term potential for things like Ether and Bitcoin certainly seem fairly strong. The short-term weakness in all of the above, absolutely the case as well. And you'd be looking, for, I think, for signs of, uh, of an upside reversal there. We're not seeing them today. Let's look at our Wrap the Week chart. This is looking at the returns and major asset classes from last Friday to where we're at right now, where we finished uh, the week. Overall, not a great week for uh, for risk assets with the S&P finishing down almost 2%. It's about 1.9%. That's the black line here. And if you follow my mouse, I'll explain the other, uh, the other items on the chart. Small caps, the IWM actually bounced today. And with the bounce you saw higher, finished the week right about in line with the, uh, with the large cap index, 1.9% down for the week. Other things that underperformed uh, the S&P, we have crude oil prices using the USO, which was down 2.4%. In orange, this is the emerging markets uh, ETF down 2.5%. In pink, we have the uh, worst performer, the NASDAQ 100, down 3.3%. So we talk about the rotation away from uh, growth and into value. The underperformance of the NASDAQ is part of that. Uh, I think part of that story for sure. A couple of things actually did just fine this week. The dollar index using the UUP was up 0.6%. Gold using the GLD was up 0.7%. The best performer, bond prices with uh, with the uh, fixed income markets doing a little better and, uh, and the TLT up 1.4%. We can add Bitcoin into the mix just to show how cryptocurrencies in general related to what we saw there. Quite a volatile week, uh, which is pretty normal. Uh, but at the end of the day, not far off from, uh, from the S&P. They ended up with a similar week with Bitcoin down 1.8%. Not too bad, to be honest with you, given 
uh, the weakness that you see in that chart. Not a not a not a horrible uh, loss of uh, of value uh, so far this week. Let's finish off our wrap the week segment looking at the mindful investor live chart. This is the list of charts that I maintain on stock charts at all times. To get here, by the way, if you've never seen the Friday show before, if you click on the articles tab. All of the, uh, the contributors to stock charts, or most of us have a homepage. Mine is called The Mindful Investor. And if you click there, all of my articles that I've written are on here. And you'll also see the link to a live chart list at the top. I encourage you to check that out. I keep this list of charts uh, updated fairly regularly, and we review them on the show every Friday. We start with the market trend model, which for me has three parts, a long-term, medium-term, and short-term uh, component. As we're watching this, I'm noticing that the uh, short-term model actually switched Negative. It actually went from short term. Um, uh, the short term model went from bullish uh, to bearish. So I'm going to update that actually as we're talking about it. So for me, the uh, the short term model is meant to tell you about the uh, you know a couple weeks, a couple days to a couple weeks really. Uh, the medium term model tells you about a couple months to a couple years, and the long term model tells you about a couple years plus sort of the long term secular trend. And if you look, the long term and the medium term both generally uh, positive or, or have been positive since. Uh, mid uh, mid 2020 with the medium term model turning bullish in May of that year and the long term model in June of that year and, and both have remained positive. The medium term model closest it got to turning negative was at the end of September, uh, but did not uh, turn negative remained uh, positive here. The short term model turning back negative. It's been a pretty noisy series, particularly in the last couple months, and it's indicated this short term fluctuation. For me, the medium term model turning negative. Uh, would be enough to tell me to be to think more risk on at this overall it's telling you the long term trend despite the weakness that you see going into the uh, into the weekend overall still pretty strong and and again even though we came off this week we're still you know this week uh, testing all time highs so we're not that far off of you know, that upside extreme the daily chart of the s p is in some ways fairly encouraging in other ways not so much and i'll try to address all those what the S&P, I think, has demonstrated over the last six weeks is the inability to get above 4,700. This brown shaded area here is where we reached the beginning of November. From there, we've now had a number of unsuccessful attempts to get above 4,700. Just yesterday, I mentioned it, I think I illustrated on the show, it's what's called a dark cloud cover candle, which is where we have a big up day. You have a big down day where we open above the yesterday's close, but we close at least half of the way down through the, uh, the real body, and that's a, uh, a short-term negative signal. So today's further downside made a ton of sense from a candle perspective using that short-term uh, measure of supply and demand. Today, the intraday low was right almost to the penny at the 50-day moving average. And so, uh, you know, we've known through much of 2021, trading down to the 50-day moving average has been an incredibly viable dip. Most recently, you saw that at the beginning of uh, December after about a 5% pullback from all-time highs in November, we saw, saw a bounce back up to retest those highs off of the 50-day moving average. We're there again today. So going into next week, I think all eyes on the 50-day. Do we hold that? If, if we don't, I would be looking down at 45.50 and then below that at 4,500. Those are the, uh, the most recent lows to see if those can hold. And then below there, we have some other support levels we talked about. On the upside, it's all about can we get above 4,700? Again, you know, the, the seasonal playbook would tell you the last couple of weeks of December tend to be pretty strong. And most likely we'd see strength rather than weakness. But seasonal tendencies are tendencies. The markets will tell you what the market trend is, and that's what's most important to follow. Now, having said that, the momentum backdrop is fairly negative. So early November, late November, uh, mid-December, uh, we've seen successively lower momentum readings, even as the S&P has tested high. So a strong bull market phase is uh, increasing prices, higher highs on consistently strong momentum. That's sort of the general thing you're looking for. The market unable to make new highs as momentum goes down is not the uh, is not the scenario to be uh, to be looking for if you're bullish. Now I did tweak one of the uh, the colors here. I have a very subjectively color coded measure of breadth. We're looking at the advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange for large caps, mid caps, small caps. Look at how the large cap breadth is different from these other three. And we've seen that before sometimes. Most recently in Ju June and early July where the breadth on the S&P was going higher, even though all the other ones were actually sloping downwards. You had a breadth divergence. We don't necessarily have that divergence now because the S&P's breadth is not making a new high. None of these are above their highs from early November, but some of these are certainly weaker than others. And you've seen the small cap and mid cap and, uh, and the NYSE breadth establishing lower, uh, lower highs, all of them below the 50-day moving average at this point. The only exception 
is the large cap uh, breadth, the S&P, which remains overall fairly constructive. So at this point, I have three of these colored more neutral uh, and, uh, and one of them still, I would say, still uh, fairly constructive. Now, these have changed from all being constructive or most of them being constructive here in, uh, in early November, you see how those breadth readings have come down. So even though the S&P is not far off of all time highs, the breadth readings certainly are. You look at this next chart, which tells you that in April, 95% of the S&P above their uh, 200 day moving average. Now it's about 70%, which doesn't seem, it seems like that's still constructive. And I get the idea. And in general, yeah, above 50% is still just fine. But think about that 25% of the S&P members were above their 200 day moving average back in April and now are below that. You don't get below the 200 day just by having a bad day or two. You really have to rotate lower to get all the way down to a 200 day moving average in a bull market phase and break it. And that's what a quarter of the S&P has done in the last six months. So in my mind, I see that declining breadth indication overall is a sign that a lot of stocks are less and less participating in this upswing as the S&P is trying to make new highs. Right now, it's almost a 50-50 split between stocks above or below their 50-day moving average, which is the other uh, key indication I would, be, uh, I would be certainly paying attention to. Just want to jump ahead a little bit to this one. We talked about sentiment yesterday. I just want to finish with a ratio or two. Consumer staples have been outperforming. And if there's a theme that I would be focusing on going into year end, it's the rally in the defensive sectors, things like utilities, REITs, um, uh, consumer staples doing well, all starting to improve on a relative basis. That is not an encouraging sign, I would argue, if you're, if you're trying to understand the implications of that. That tells you investors are getting more defensive. You combine that with the sentiment picture we talked about yesterday with the, uh, the, the uh, name exposure index telling you that a lot of money managers are rotating more to the defensive uh, positioning. This ratio is illustrating that that is actually, actually the case, and it's being reflected in the ratio of consumer discretionary to consumer staples. So that is the backdrop we find ourselves in as we go into the last two weeks of the year. It tends to be flat to positive. Overall, it tends to be uh, stronger rather than weaker with the Santa Claus rally as what uh, normally, uh, normally happens. But uh, as once uh, was said, uh, as I was told early on, when Santa Claus can fail to call, bears may come to broad and wall. I just dug that out of somewhere. But basically, if the Santa Claus rally doesn't happen, this would be a bearish sign for January. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Great to have you along this journey with us all in 2021, and particularly today. A couple of quick announcements before we get to our mailbag. Number one, we here are here for your questions, and our mailbag is driven all by questions that we get from you via email and elsewhere. And we very much appreciate your feedback on the show and absolutely would love to hear your questions. What are you running into as you're trying to use charts to make better investment decisions? Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our stock charts channel. We'll gather all those questions and we will answer your questions in the new year. We'll keep the mailbag running all uh, over the uh, the holiday break. Keep them coming anytime they come up, and we'll uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can in the new year. Also, as a reminder, go to StockChartsTV.com. The holiday season is such a great time to think about the year behind you, 2021. Start to set yourself up for success next year. There's so much content that our, uh, our great contributors provide every trading day to help you make better decisions. Go to StockChartsTV.com. It is free. You just need your email address to set up an account. Or on any of your mobile devices, just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let us open the final bar mailbag. Again, keep your questions coming all through the holidays and we'll gather them all and, uh, and do more mailbag segments uh, fright, fresh and early in the, uh, in the new year. Let's get to question number one. Please comment on the very tight price action of MIME over the past week. A huge change of character with essentially the same constant open close high, open, close, high low price and narrow bid and ask spread. Um, let's look at this one. Ticker's MIME, which actually is a name I don't know very well. MIME cast, okay, it's a five, 5.3 billion market cap. Yeah, with pretty flat. So not knowing much about this company, I would guess, and I'll look on the other screen here very quickly. My guess is this is a um, either a buyout 
This is a company that's uh, been in, a, in an M&A activity or, um, yeah, here we go. Uh, it's becoming a private company uh, transaction with uh, Permira. So, so basically, this is a stock that is going private. And what happens when you see a chart that has a certain dynamic and then it flatlines, that usually represents some M&A. And what's happened recently is it's, uh, you know, it's companies going private that are, are no longer being publicly listed. So what happens is the price kind of settle, set, settles into where the price should be given that, and then it won't fluctuate very much. It's just little cosmetic stuff that's going to happen from there. And uh, usually you move on to something else. It's just, there's not going to be much movement in there because there's no reason for the stock to be uh, to be trading very often. Um, so flatline usually represents something like that. And that is what is going to happen with a, uh, with a chart. And it happens a lot. And, and, and usually if you can you just Google the ticker, you'll find uh, what was causing the, uh, the change. But that's what happened there. It's a company going private. That's what happens to a, a beautiful price chart when uh, something like that occurs. Next question. Looking at the monthly chart of Apache, APA, I am seeing a rising wedge, a bearish rising wedge, but looking at the weekly and daily charts, I see a rising channel, uh, bullish. Which annotation interpretation takes precedence? I love this question. You sent two charts along with you and I'll share, this was the monthly chart that you sent. And I see you're showing this bullish rising wedge, which is a, you know, sort of a contrary move. You have a move lower, you have a rising pattern where there's sort of a narrowing uh, between the highs and the lows. And I see you're sort of illustrating that here. This was the daily chart that you shared. And now you're showing more of a channel, a trend channel off of the lows, more of a parallel movement between the highs and the lows. So what's causing this? So uh, a couple of things that I would, I would suggest to you. So number one, you may know this or you may not, but you're actually looking at an arithmetic scale here on chart number two on the daily chart. And on your monthly chart, you're using a log scale. So, uh, you know, in the semi-log scale is a commonly used technique. And anytime you're looking at long-term charts, I would argue you 100% of the time should be using a log scale. So on both of these charts, a log scale makes a lot more sense because what happens is stocks don't really over the long-term trade in dollars and cents, although they do, you know, literally, but over time, it's more about the percent movements, right? A, a stock like Apple isn't going to change you know, five cents on a day, where if something's trading at 10 cents, then five cents in a day is a huge move, right? It's a it's a 50% move. But for Apple, it's a rounding error. So stocks tend to have bigger dollar moves when they have traded a higher amount because there's more movement and it makes more sense. So percentage terms are a much better way of looking at a long-term performance of a stock, which is why your monthly chart makes a ton of sense. Log scale, which means equal distances are equal percent moves, in which case your uh, sort of rising wedge makes sense, sort of a narrowing higher highs and higher lows, but the range is kind of coming together. And that's actually a negative sign if and when you break below the lower end of that. On your daily chart, you've made an arithmetic scale. And the problem is it's, it's changing the character of this. Um, and, and what happens is it exaggerates uh, the lower movements and kind of minimizes the impact of some of these other ones. And, and, and as a result, it, 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 it changes the alignment of these. The other thing that's going to happen when you go from monthly charts to daily charts is because highs and lows can happen all during a month. An entire month is summarized as one bar, or one candle. So the angles of things can be very different. Um, so in this case, yeah, it's overall, it's constructive until you break down through the lower, uh, lower end. And I guess that's what I would... I would say with both of these, remember that with both of these patterns, you're illustrating an uptrend in the price action. Either one of these would be negative if you break down through the lower end of that channel, either the lower end of the trend channel here or the lower end of the of the of the rising wedge that you showed on the monthly chart. That neither of those are valid breakdowns until you break down through the lower end. So I would be keeping an eye on on that lower end of both of those uh, charts, and I would absolutely be using a log scale on your daily chart. That's going to be more of an apples to apples look, and I would argue a better way of representing that uh, that trend. Next question, and thank you for those. Uh, ACP has a few indicators such as TTM Squeeze. Yeah, that's uh, TG Watkins. No, that's actually the simpler trading plugin that we have. Uh, or moving average ribbon or distance from moving average, which are not in sharp charts. Will these indicators be incorporated in sharp charts as well? I tell you what, that is a lot of what we are talking about as a management team at Stock Charts. This is one of the indicators you mentioned. This is Ford and ACP. And I'm doing one of the indicators called distance from simple moving average 200, literally showing how far we are from the 200 day simple moving average. You can do different combinations of there, uh, there as well. So what happened is we added the ACP platform and spent a lot of uh, resources earlier in 2000, uh, 2020. And then in 2021, you know, getting this uh, platform rolled out, it allowed us to do things like having a plugin environment. So 
you know, uh, simpler trading with our TTM squeeze and uh, TG Watkins Moxie indicator, and many, many others, Chicken Analytics with their uh, Chicken Power Gauge. There's a lot of really cool uh, plugins that we were able to, uh, to create in ACP because of the design of that platform. In 2022, we are talking a lot about how we're going to upgrade this part of stock charts, which is the traditional part of stock charts, the Sharp Charts engine. I will tell you a year from now, I, I am highly confident that this page will look different in a lot of really positive ways. We're not going to lose any functionality. We will be committed to that, but we are going to upgrade some of the uh, the functionality, which, which could use a facelift, could use some upgraded uh, interactive elements, more of the UI uh, experience. Also, there are a lot of indicators that we were able to add into ACP that we did not get into sharp charts, and more and more, we're going to try to make those platforms have similar libraries of content you can access. So the short answer is, uh, I, I don't know specifically about everything you said. I do know we are committed to try to get as much as we can into Sharp Charts. We need to make some improvements to the Sharp Charts engine, which we're going to be doing at the beginning of next year, and then we'll start adding as much as we can. But look for a lot of really good stuff in terms of functionality in the new year. Last question. Do you have any ideas for measuring trend exhaustion? I keep struggling by way of analysis paralysis and keep adding technical indicators. I was up on UPST, which is Upstart Holdings. Uh, I was up there about 20%, but gave it all back and sold it at break even. Any, any indicator that you know of that is good to note the end of the trend? So a lot of really interesting points to your question. We don't have time to go through all of it. But you know, when you said, I struggle by way of analysis paralysis and keep adding technical indicators, I would encourage you to not do that, right? The more you add, a lot of times you're adding noise. At this point, you've got four different indicators. If you look at price, the moving averages, and then three different indicators, maybe five or six if you include volume. I wouldn't go any more than that because the problem when you have, I found when you have too many technical indicators is you will find a reason to do whatever you want. And it is a great way to make confirmation bias flourish in your investment process, which is not what you want. You want things to be more objective. And I would, I, you, you see the charts that I share tend to be a little more simplistic because keeping it simple means it's more robust. It's gonna work better in different environments is what I've found. What you're hitting on is some of the is some of the issues, right? If you're if you're trying to be a trend follower, which is what I try to do, it's really hard to pick the actual top because my toolkit is not designed to pick the top. It's designed to recognize when the trend is no longer in play. So when this sort of breakdown happens and you get below the 50-day and you gap lower, that's probably when I would start to be avoiding this. And, and again, you give up the beginning of that sell-off, but you are out of it for the rest of the move. I would encourage you uh, just briefly to look at divergences, look at RSI divergences. You can see the chicken money flow as the uh, as the stock went higher, the trend in the money flow is actually negative. Uh, and those are signs of trend exhaustion that I would start thinking of a little bit more maybe than you have. We need to wrap today's show, folks. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is Hess, the energy sector coming off and uh, and uh, energy prices a little bit lower today. And that, that trend has been happening for the last month or two. Hess is one that I think when I'm looking at a chart like this is one of the big integrated names in, uh, in the energy space. The June high was significant. We retested that and we're unable to get higher. You have a lot of names. The S&P arguably is doing that now. Anytime you have a, a chart that tries to get to a certain level and, is, and then just is unable to do it anymore, that tells you, you know, you, you've met resistance and, uh, and it's been too heavy. So 90, 92 is sort of the resistance level to pay attention to. From here, we've rolled over and now we're below two moving averages and we're testing a new swing low here. Lower highs, lower lows, or a downtrend, the momentum overall is pretty negative. I would be looking for some sort of upside reversal. I could see energy being a really good bet in 2022, but I would want to see some improvement, which you're not seeing yet in some of those integrated charts. Chart number two, KBE, which is the bank ETF. Again, I, I, I get the narrative of higher rates. I, I am fairly confident we're going to have higher interest rates through the course of 2022, most likely 2023. Most likely, that should mean banks should be doing really well because that is a good tailwind for their business. You're not seeing that in the last uh, four weeks. Going into next year, I'll be looking to see if the KBE can stabilize, can start to rotate higher. But as of today, it's closing right at the 200-day moving average. Last time in September, we bounced higher. Can it do it again this time, finally, biotech bouncing off of weakness on the Fibonacci retracements, a nice move higher testing the 50 day. I'd love to see if that can get higher going into next week. Folks, that is our show, a wrap for this week and a wrap for 2021 in terms of our live programming on the final bar. Keep with us all the next two weeks. We have so much great content for you to help you think about this year and plan for success in next year. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great holiday. We'll see you in the new year. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.